welcome Emily Bazelon. She is a great uh, colleague and friend. She's a writer for the New York Times Magazine. She uh, teaches at Yale Law School, and she is one of America's most insightful writers about the courts and the criminal justice system. So we're so lucky to have her with us to answer questions. And Emily, we just jumped right in. The students have all sorts of great questions about the election system. And I, Curry, shall we just start reading from the chat box or do you wanna uh, post I mean, them? I love, I think you gave a great foundation kind of where we are right now in what the courts are seeing around elections. So I would love to start with the chat box. Yeah, or, let's you know, do it. I love these questions. <laughs> yeah. Great, well, um, um, Alan says, a federal statute says the presidential election takes place on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. But doesn't the president have broad public safety powers in the event of a disaster to override such requirements? Emily, why don't you start? So that is such a great question. <laughs> um, I'm gonna argue that the answer is no. Jeff may see it differently. So. Um, just to back up a second, the federal law Alan's talking about was passed in 1845. It sets this day um, and it would take both houses of Congress to change that law. The president could certainly try with some emergency powers to override that statute. There would be a huge legal fight over that. And I am now gonna look to an opinion of the Wisconsin Supreme Court about their election law. Now, you know, federal election law is different from Wisconsin. This was a very unpopular decision in Wisconsin. Um, but what the, so, and let me explain the facts. The Wisconsin primary was scheduled for April 7th. The governor um, asked the legislature to send an absentee ballot to everyone. This is like, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, the legislature said no. He asked the legislature to postpone the in-person voting. The legislature said no. And then at the last minute, he postponed the date of the election himself. There was a court challenge. The legislature and the Republican party um, challenged this. I should say that we're talking about a Democratic governor, Tony Evers in Wisconsin and a Republican controlled legislature. And the Wisconsin Supreme Court looked at the statute. The governor had broad public health emergency powers, but the Wisconsin Supreme Court said, you know what? Those broad powers don't allow you to effectively overturn an otherwise valid statute. Doesn't say anything in this law about how you can just wave a magic wand and get rid of all these other laws. So that looked pretty persuasive to me, both as a matter of Wisconsin law and as a matter of the sort of principles of how these things should work. I should say there's a wrinkle here. Wisconsin also has a public health statute that gives its health commissioner the power to postpone or um, uh, cancel large gatherings um, in the event of a public health emergency. The governor didn't invoke that provision for kind of technical reasons. Uh, and so that wasn't an issue. Um, so anyway, in the context of the election where we're just talking about this sort of emergency executive power, the Wisconsin Supreme Court really set a limit. That limit makes sense to me, but I wonder Jeff, whether you think I'm being, whether I'm missing something and being uh, incomplete here. No, that was such a wonderful answer, Emily, and thank you for having explaining the Wisconsin Supreme Court decision so well. Um, and uh, I haven't read it yet, and and you've uh, whet my appetite for it. All of our friends uh, should as well. But what I took from your really informative answer was that in many of these cases, it will be a question of state law uh, on the state level. And uh, similarly, as Emily accurately said, the the relevant federal statute is fixed. Um, and uh, if the president were try, were going to try to pass it, it would provoke a similar, tremendous court challenge. And I completely agree with her that it's even hard to see any precedence for uh, courts deferring to a president's attempt to override the congressional statute regulating elections on the grounds of a public health emergency. Um, maybe the only other thing to throw in, uh, from, which is familiar to all of us, uh, by this point in our conversations is that the framework that the Supreme Court uses in evaluating the president's emergency powers comes from the Youngstown sheet and tube case. Remember friends, those three categories, when the president is acting according to uh, a delegated power from Congress, when Congress has given him the power to do something, he acts at the zenith or height of his powers. 
when he's acting in the face of explicit congressional disapproval, his power is at its lowest point or its nadir. And when Congress is vague, he acts in what's called a zone of twilight. Ooh, <laughs> horror movie. And then, then it's not clear what the answer is. Here, obviously, he'd be acting in the face of explicit congressional disapproval, and his power would be as nadir. You'd have to have unbelievably strong reasons for doing it. No interests on the other side. Very, very hard to imagine the court buying that. And uh, great uh, answers for Emily about how complicated it's going to be state by state on the ground. Can I just add one thing about this? Um, Jared Kushner, one of the president's advisors and son-in-law was asked about the date of the election the other day. And he said, oh, I can't commit. Um, this is not in Jared Kushner's power. He doesn't get to decide. And I sort of assumed from his answer that he didn't know about this law and had never really thought about this before. I could be wrong, but I there was a lot of uh, concern that he was putting this up in the air, but it's it's not up in the air. Fascinating. All right, let's uh, go to our next question, which is... Uh, I have one from David Olson, if you'd like me to read it. Um, sure. Are there any federal court or constitutional remedies when different states have widely different access laws? Many states issuing absentee ballot applications to all or vote by mail. Are there any equal protection issues here? These are really good, hard questions. He, he's one of our teachers on our advisory board, so he's a smart okay. cookie. <laughs> you. Um, <laughs> So that is a great question that I really hope we don't see tested, but we could. Um, you know, Congress, the, the way the Constitution deals with election law is that Congress um, has this kind of fail safe like backup power, but effectively states set the time, place and manner of federal elections with this understanding that Congress could kind of step in. And Congress has passed national access laws about elections in the last 20 years. We have the, what's known as the Motor Voter Law and also the Help America Vote Act. Those are both from like the 90s and early 2000s and they were passed um, mostly to increase access to the ballot. So there is some present, this some federal law here, but the questions about, um, mail-in ballot access, you're right, they wild, do wildly differ between the states. We're now at a situation, I just wrote about this, so these details are in my head. There are 14 or 15 states in the country where you still have to make an excuse to request an absentee ballot. You basically have to say, either I'm gonna be out of the state or I'm gonna be sick. Then there are all the other states where you can just ask for an absentee ballot application and they'll send you one, you don't have to like explain yourself, but that doesn't uh, guarantee a smoothly processed election if we have a huge move to vote by mail in the, with the threat of the pandemic. And the reason for that is there are a lot of states like my state of Connecticut, the last election, 3% of people voted by mail. That's what the state's used to doing. If 75% of people vote by mail, and that's actually what we saw in this Wisconsin primary, they went from 3% to 74%, you can expect a lot of problems. The state in for a while, a little bit in Wisconsin, they ran out of envelopes. They just didn't have a big enough print order. Imagine a world in which all the states in September ask the people who produce bulk uh, you know, ballots and envelopes, we need millions and millions all of a sudden, like that's not gonna work. That's the same kind of supply chain problem we've seen with um, masks and other equipment for the pandemic. So that's the real, in some ways, it's not so much a legal gap as it is like a practical and logistical one. Um, but I think you also are going to see challenges to state laws that, um, that limit access. One issue is who pays to mail out absentee ballots? Or are there ways in which to use um, the federal constitution or state constitution equity um, arguments to make on those grounds? In general, though, uh, you know, there have been these kind of limited applications of equal protection law. So we saw the Supreme Court make an equal protection argument in Bush versus Gore for the way that Florida counted its ballots. But even in the moment the Supreme Court did that, it was this sort of like one ticket only decision, which really hasn't led to other case law about equal protection that might help you make an argument that, well, this state is mailing absentee ballots and paying for it and my state isn't. Um, we just haven't really seen very much of that kind of federal remedy, I think. 
Wonderful. There are so many great questions and Emily is so well informed in all of this because her uh, reporting and is, has been so superb that I'm just gonna pose a few more to her because I'm really eager for the answers as well. Sandy asks, in the Georgia primary coming up, they've designated selected mailboxes for mailing early vote absentee ballots. In one country, they've installed cameras so they can scream fraud if, for example, an elderly woman has her grandson mail her ballot in this coronavirus environment. Is this legal? Oh my God, these are great <laughs> questions. Yes, um, so, <laughs> and Georgia is a great state to ask about. There's been a lot of controversy in the last several years about access to the ballot in Georgia, um, having to do really like coming to a floor with the um, governor's race between Stacey Abrams, who ran as a Democrat in 2018. She lost to Brian Kemp. Um, he was the secretary of state in Georgia, which meant he was the chief election official. And now uh, another guy whose first name is out of my head, but his name is Raffensperger, is the, um, Brad Raffensperger is the Secretary of State in Georgia. And he has been talking a lot about fraud. He actually is um, one of the only election officials who set up a statewide absentee ballot fraud task force. And what some of the voting rights advocates connected with Stacey Abrams said about that was that looked to them like voter intimidation. If you're kind of warning people, if you don't sign your ballot or deliver it properly, we're gonna investigate you. If you're worried, um, you're just uncertain about the legality of what you're doing, or maybe if you lived with people who are undocumented, if you just feel vulnerable, that could discourage you from voting. I think we may see legal challenges about that. And that relates to this idea of installing cameras. Um, you know, fraud is always a justification that people give for suppressing the vote and reducing participation, because it sounds like a reasonable problem to worry about. And indeed it is. I mean, we do, we all want to prevent fraud in elections. Like that's alarming to think that people could be stuffing bags with absentee ballots and changing election results. That is unusual. It is not unheard of. Um, when people talk about in-person voting fraud at the actual polling place, that really like literally almost never happens. I can't tell you the same thing about absentee ballot fraud. Um, in 2018, there was a congressional race in North Carolina in which the Republican who candidate hired a political operative who was accused of and, and it seems like really did try to sway that election by collecting as many as 800 ballots and um, filling them in to complete them, maybe throwing some of them away. Um, the Republican won by only 905 votes. So those 800 ballots loomed very large. And in fact, the bipartisan election commission in North Carolina canceled the election and made them do it over. And a different person won in the end. So that is a real concern. The problem is do we address it in a way that um, reinforces trust in the results and encourages people to think this was a fair contest? Or do we try to address it in a way that scares people and makes them think like the police are gonna come after them if they don't fill out their ballot properly? The most encouraging thing I found out about this when I was reporting my story, uh, which just ran in the Times, was that in the states that have the most vote by mail, they're like at 95%, there are five of these states, they have very clean track records. They have figured out how to do this safely, securely. They send you an envelope, it has a bar code on it. They can track it through the postal service. They know when you get it. You can return it through the mail. You can also put it in a secure drop box. You can bring it back to an on-site polling place on election day. And I was talking to the Secretary of State of Colorado, which is one of these universal vote by mail states. And she said, you know, we report every case of suspected fraud and our rate in 2018 was 0.0027%. In other words, like a really tiny number of people were really even suspected of doing this. Um, so those are the kind of factors to weigh in thinking about the legality of um, whether you could install cameras. You know, what kind of justification would the state have to take that kind of remedy and could someone who cares about access to the ballot and come in and say, wait a second, th there's a small risk here, but what you're doing is discouraging people to vote to such a degree that that just shouldn't be allowed. Thank you very much. Fascinating. And uh, uh, friends, let's make sure to read Emily's story as well so you can get even more of those great details. A bunch of our questions ask about the circumstances under which 
the Supreme Court defers to the states. One of our questioners asks, thinking about Bush, uh, Sarah Cunningham says, thinking about Bush v. Gore, when does SCOTUS defer to the states and when not? Teddy asks, is it constitutional to deny voting rights because you ran out of an envelope? Uh, Mark Naden asks, why did the US Supreme Court get involved with the Wisconsin election and what was their reason? And we also have a question that says, is it disenfranchisement not to allow someone to vote because they haven't gotten a ballot? So let me just set up these questions in this way. Um, the Wisconsin Supreme Court, as I mentioned, uh, Mark, at the very beginning, invoked this principle called the Purcell principle, which says that courts ordinarily should not get involved in elections at the last minute to change the rules. But it said that that's a ticket for that train only and that um, it wasn't saying what it was gonna do in, in future elections. The broader question of what standard the Supreme Court uses to decide whether someone's equal rights to voting has been violated is really tricky as we learned in Bush v. Gore. So Emily, how, how does this work for a summary and then you can take it away from here. The court has a whole bunch of different voting rights violations. First, there's the right to an equally weighted vote. That's the um, malapportionment cases where some voting districts were drawn in ways that gave people in rural counties much more power than other uh, uh, urban voters. And that led to the principle of one man, one vote. Then there's the principle of equal access to the ballot. You can't on the basis of race or other illicit factors prevent someone from voting. Then there's the right to an equally meaningful vote, the right to elect representatives of your choice. And that was the right in cases involving what are called racial gerrymandering when voting districts are drawn to allow minorities a, a fair chance to elect the representatives of their choice. The Bush v. Gore right was a kind of new right to for every ballot to be treated in precisely the same way as every other ballot. And I always had trouble, Emily, uh, articulating exactly what that constitutional principle was. Maybe you can sit, tell, tell our friends how you understand it and how you think, if at all, that Bush v. Gore right of ballots to be treated equally principle would apply to a question of whether a ballot that's not received in time gets counted or whether someone who hasn't gotten their ballot in time to mail it in gets counted or whether the Constitution doesn't speak to those situations at all. Yeah, I mean, I think the Constitution could speak to those dis those situations. I'm not particularly hopeful that the one ticket only decision in Bush versus Gore is going to help a whole lot in in the kind of hypothetical scenario you're laying out where someone doesn't get their ballot in time. Part of the reason I'm not hopeful is the experience in Wisconsin. So. I mentioned earlier the oh, Wisconsin Supreme Court decision, and that was in the context of the legislature challenging the governor's move to postpone the election. There was a separate federal challenge that was going on. And what happened in that case was people in Wisconsin could see that there were a lot of people not getting their absentee ballots in time. There were thousands of requests. There was a big backlog. The local election officials were saying, we can't get all of these ballots out in time. And so the, there was a federal lawsuit um, basically arguing that the state couldn't properly conduct this election and that people's right to vote were being violated. Um, and what the federal district court listened to all this testimony, including from the local election officials saying we can't do this right in time. And what he did, he said, you know what, I can't step in for the governor and the legislature and postpone the election. But what I am gonna do is give people six more days to return their ballots. So he moved the deadline for mailing your ballot back in or returning it to a drop off box. He moved the deadline from April 7th to April 13th. And when I read that opinion, I thought like, this is a really thoughtful kind of incremental, pretty small, change the election this judge is making to protect the franchise and protect people's right to vote. That case went up first to the appeals court, which um, affirmed the district court's decision. Then it went up to the United States Supreme Court. So we, this is a separate track. We're in federal lawsuit land instead of state lawsuit land. And five to four ideological split, the conservatives on the Supreme Court said no. They said that the federal government had violated the Purcell principle that Jeff was talking about earlier by interfering, making a change in an election too late in the process. And they returned, reverted the deadline for returning absentee ballots from April 13th to April 7th. So 
there were a couple of problems with that. There were people who had received their ballots with instructions from the state that said, you have till April 13th. That wasn't true anymore, but they didn't necessarily know that. And so when I was talking to local election officials after the election, one of the things that for them was really troubling was that they were receiving ballots from drop-off boxes at the local library all the way up to the 13th because people like hadn't kept track of the latest news. They were still coming. They thought their votes would be counted, but the Supreme Court had invalidated all of those votes. And the Supreme Court, in its opinion, did not mention at all any of these people who were waiting for their absentee ballots and had not received them. So that all seemed quite troubling from the point of view of um, this Supreme Court seeing our constitution as a vehicle for addressing the problems of absentee ballots not being um, sent out in time or not being returned in time. And I definitely worry about that um, for November in terms of the kind of precedent that it set. Thank you for that. Thank you for noting all of those questions. And as you suggest, and as Justice Ginsburg uh, predicted, um, several of the ballots did uh, arrive late. And as it turned out, they weren't postmarked at all just because of a weird way that the ballots were mailed. And some of the, some of the ones that were not postmarked but received before April 13th were actually counted. We have yes, you're right. There was this weird thing where the Supreme Court didn't seem to understand that Wisconsin didn't have postmark in their statute yeah. and referred to a postmark. And then the election officials were like, okay, we'll use the postmark date. And that did allow some ballots to be counted almost sort of as an accident. Yeah. Um, uh, Clark asks, what, what is the Purcell principle, P-U-R-C-E-L-L? -L? And it's basically that courts shouldn't intervene in elections in the last minute. And that was based in a case where the Supreme Court thought that lower courts should have more time to review a record before the Supreme Court made a final judgment and changed the rules. But you, Emily, just being as charitable as possible. I, I, you know, I have to be completely uh, nonpartisan here and have no opinions whatsoever. No Is, opinions. No Definitely opinions. never have any opinions. I never have any opinions. Do you, what, 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 do, do you think, if you, if you were trying to make a, the strongest case for applying the Purcell principle to Wisconsin, what, what would it be? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it would be that even a week before an election is too late for a federal court to make any kind of change at all to the election. And, you know, what I have an easier time being fair about is the idea of last minute changes to an election, like that is a problem. Uncertainty is a big problem for people. I don't actually think this federal judge extending the deadline for absentee ballots was a problem. When you think about that, you think like, well, that just gives people a few more days. How's that really gonna hurt anyone? But imagine a different scenario where a federal judge closes some polling places and orders others to open or changes the date of the election, which was the scenario we started out talking about. You could really see that doing that at the last minute would disenfranchise a lot of people. And if we're looking ahead to November and we want to make sure we have a smooth, properly run election, one we can all trust in as Americans, it'll be really important not to have those kinds of last minute changes. Great. That was a wonderful uh, job. <laughs> Thank you for doing that so well. You, you did that, you gave more reasons than the Supreme Court majority opinion. So that was great. <laughs> we have a bunch of questions about technology and Voting, uh, Sharon Bui asked, do you think hesitation to vote by mail or online is a generational matter? Power is held by those with the most tenure, which are older folks. A, a bunch of, Hal says, do federal and state ballots distinguish between an official US postmark versus a private postage stamp? Uh, and might online voting solve that question? Um, so, to talk about online voting, that there is concern about its accuracy and the need to have a paper record to avoid hacking. But are any states considering moving to online voting for the November election? What legal issues might that raise, if any? And what are other legal and constitutional issues involving online voting? I haven't heard anyone talk about online voting for November. Um, I think that it seems too hackable and too insecure. And at this moment where we're worried about our domestic fairness and also about foreign interference, which we can expect, the idea of having online voting, which wouldn't have a paper record makes everybody too nervous. And I think that's probably correct. Um, it is certainly true that for young people voting digitally would, be, would seem much more natural. 
Um, and I would hope that eventually we would get there. But right now, I'm just happy to hear that states have a uh, means of registering to vote online because not every state has that. Well, I think if we could start there and really get that up and running and have the states have full faith that it can't be hacked and that it's working the way they need it to, then we could start talking about online voting. Um, the mail has some advantages. You're right that older people have used it more um, in the past. Um, one of the challenges that some young people have said to me is that they don't actually have stamps lying around. Like that's not a thing, they don't mail letters. Um, and so I think there are a couple ways to take care of that. States can have drop off boxes and sites like the library or it's, or on the day of the election, we should say um, it's important to note that voting by mail, even in the states where 95% of people do it, there are still polling places. There are people who don't have stable mailing addresses who need to vote in person and also people with certain disabilities like blindness who need assistance. So no state has closed all its polling places. And that's another thing you can do with your ballot is drop it off as opposed to putting it into a mailbox. Um, another thing states can do is pay the postage. And the issue with that in the fall is going to be that the states, as you know, are um, you know, really taking a huge financial hit from coronavirus and they do not have enough money to do all of the election preparation that um, we're, we're talking about that they need. So Congress has been told by the Brennan Center for Justice, this nonpartisan group that has done a lot of work, like they probably need about um, $4 billion to do the elections right. That includes all the primaries that haven't been held yet, as well as the general election. So far, Congress has only pledged 400 million. That's a big gap, um, you know, multiples more money that's needed. And this is unfortunately turned into a really partisan battle where Democrats want to fund the election and Republicans are resisting, at least in Washington. You talk to state officials in the states, it's pretty bipartisan support for money for the election, but that's not the case in Washington. And so that's a big challenge going forward. Fascinating. So some, several of our friends ask more details about the situation on the ground noting only 15 states have drop-off sites and only 15 have mail-in ballot options. How do we get in gear by November? And give us a sense more broadly about how many are planning to get mail-in ballot options. We saw that California just mailed out ballots. Are those 15 states likely to increase? And how many states are planning to have mail-in options by November? So there are some of the 15 states I named earlier where you have to have an excuse that have already said we're going to lift that excuse in November. So the governor of New Hampshire, who's a Republican, he said pandemic still a threat. Everybody gets a ballot mailed to them or at least an application for a ballot, I should say. Same in my home state of Connecticut, which has never done this before and where you also have to have an excuse. On the other hand, in Texas, um, which is another state where you have to have an excuse, the attorney general has gone to court to argue that if you're not sick and you're asking for a mail ballot because you're afraid of the virus, that's not a valid reason. Um, and he has even gone so far as to say that if you advise someone to go get a ballot because of fear of the pandemic, that you could face criminal sanctions. So that's sort of like the Georgia example we were talking about earlier, where you have um, a move by a state official that really looks like it's trying to reduce participation um, going forward. And that is still being litigated. That attorney general could well lose in the courts in Texas. But right now, we just don't know the answer. Uh, thanks for that. Um, and and are, are any additional states likely to adopt mail-in? I think that we, I don't think we're gonna see more universal vote by mail, but I think you're gonna, well, I guess I'll say this, if the pandemic remains a threat, I think you're gonna see more states do what um, I just mentioned from Connecticut. Uh, and New York is sort of moving in this direction. Massachusetts, the legislature has talked about this. And there's this kind of interesting, um, uh, geography to this. So the states that have the mo the highest rates of vote by mail, like between 60 and 95% are all in the West. It's like Utah, Colorado, Oregon, Washington, Hawaii, and then California, Montana, Arizona are pretty high up there. And then there are a bunch of states on the East Coast and, and the Midwest that are the most restrictive. So I mentioned Texas, Connecticut, Massachusetts. 
these dates, part of it, I think, is like it's just more old fashioned. Um, and in my reporting, someone mentioned to me that the Western states that started vote by mail earlier and have done the most with it also are the states that gave women the right to vote before the 19th Amendment in mm -hmm. 1919. Like they were early on to women's suffrage, which is really interesting. I'm not sure what the correlation is. Maybe they're just like more innovative, these places. Um, but I think you will see some of the East Coast states move toward more vote by mail access. The question is going to be in states like Texas um, that seem to be really trying to reduce access, like I said, whether there's political pressure on state officials to increase vote by mail. Um, one part of this that I always think is important to say is that voting by mail does not help Democrats and it does not help Republicans. It's been shown so far across the country to have no partisan effect. It does a little bit increase turnout. You would kind of hope that everyone could get on board for that in an election in which people have a lot of reasons to fear for their health. Um, and one thing we saw in the Wisconsin primary were people standing in really long lines at the polls and then people got sick afterward and those infections got traced to that election day according to the state health officials. So that should throw into very sharp relief the idea that we do not want people to have to choose between their health and their right to vote. Um, but there are states in which really we have not seen that kind of bipartisan agreement yet. That's uh, striking about those uh, infection rates. Yeah. And really interesting also to note that the Western states which gave women the right to vote are being most innovative here. Our exhibits team for our 19th Amendment exhibit, which we can't wait to open when the building reopens, found that some Western states have voted, adopted the right to vote to women because they were trying to persuade people to emigrate to their states. They were seeking population. So totally, they were like, come, you can vote, suffrage. It's such a cool part of the story. I love that part. And it would be a great incentive today as well. Talk about um, voter ID laws and the legal challenges surrounding them. In Pennsylvania, uh, you have to have a driver's license or state ID to get a mail-in ballot. Many young people have neither. Uh, does that cause a drop off in that age group? And, and more broadly, we've seen a series of legal challenges around voter ID stemming from a five to four Supreme Court decision, which said that in at least some circumstances, voter ID laws are unconstitutional, or sorry, are permissible, are consistent with the constitution. What if any legal challenges might arise from those laws coming up? Yeah, so the Supreme Court did um, allow for what's called restrictive voter ID and restrictive voter ID means you have to show your ID at the poll when you vote and the state can make a list of the types of ID that they'll um, approve and it doesn't have to be a particularly long list, um, which is why the point about driver's licenses or other forms of I think social security ID comes up in states like Pennsylvania and it is a barrier to voting, sometimes for young people, also tends to be um, people without ID are more likely to be poor and more likely to be elderly. It's not a huge problem for turnout. So it's something that I think um, deservedly gets attention because it's a barrier that is designed, if anything, to prevent in-person voting fraud. And like I said earlier, that hardly ever happens. So one, uh, piece of data to explain why I keep saying that. There was a big exhaustive search for um, voter fraud in person after the 26, 2016 election. I think more than 100 million people voted in that election. Four cases of in-person voter fraud, even suspected, were found. So it's really not a problem. And that would be my argument for why we should not have voter ID. The impact of voter ID on participation has been lower than I think a lot of the opponents of voter ID fear. Um, it turns out like a lot of people have to have some form of ID just to kind of do their life. Um, and so that has proved to be less of a barrier. That doesn't mean that we need to have it there, but that's sort of how that has played out. There are certain states in which the state Supreme Court based on the state constitution um, disallowed voter ID. I'm pretty sure Missouri, for example, has that. Um, and so that's this sort of interesting wrinkle in our federalist system that even when the United Supreme Court says the federal constitution is not a barrier to a law like voter ID, a state can still say, well, our state constitution has a broader conception of the right to vote than um, the United States Supreme Court is saying about the federal constitution. And I would just note in this area that there is no right to vote in our constitution. Those words don't appear. 
There are lots of, um, not lots, there are several amendments that address the right to vote. Um, and there's the 14th Amendment, which provides for equal protection under the law, which has been really important in things like one person, one vote, that like super key standard that Jeff started out with. But to me, it seems like a real problem that we don't just enshrine the right to vote in the Constitution, because I think some of the problems you all are raising in your questions would be more easily addressed if we had that kind of just clear language in our Constitution. Uh, it's so true. The, the um, ambiguity about what the right to vote entails has led to the most contested questions in constitutional history, starting after the 15th Amendment, when you had the formal right to vote, but it didn't pr prohibit poll taxes and literacy tests explicitly, and, and that was used to disenfranchise people. And um, the question of exactly what the right to vote entitles you to um, had not traditionally been covered by the Constitution, and now that it's beginning to, we're finding lots and lots of uncertainty. Uh, Nina asks a great question. It seems like mail-in voting would be helpful regardless of COVID-19. For example, the elderly, those working long hours may have difficulty voting in person. The constitution says states will decide how elections are carried out. However, voting is a matter of free speech. It's political speech. Would Citizens United support a SCOTUS decision that mail-in voting is free speech and then incorporate that to the states? That's such a nice idea, I like these creative uses of Citizens United. Citizens United says that money equals speech. It does not say that voting equals speech. Now, you and I might wish differently, but that's what that decision right now stands for. So I'm not sure that's gonna be our vehicle for getting where you wanna go. Um, the idea that mail-in ballots, mail -in, the voting by mail has lots of utility, forget the pandemic is one that the states that use it a lot are feel very confident about. And so when I was calling around to the secretaries of state who are in charge of elections in places like Colorado and Washington and Utah, they basically are saying like, we know how to do this, come, like we'll advise you, we'll help you pull this off, we'll, um, we'll show you the way basically. And one sort of hopeful note about this is that in those states, when vote by mail passed, it was kind of controversial. It was sometimes a ballot measure that people voted for directly. In some cases, it happened through the legislature, but there was like partisan dissent about it. Um, people argued about whether it was a good idea. Once it's in place, people tend to settle down and decide that they like it um, and use it a lot. So that is reassuring to me. I think sometimes with big systemic changes like this, People get nervous about things they haven't done before. Um, I was on the radio last week talking about these issues and someone called in and said, voting by mail is only for like sick people. Nobody else is ever gonna wanna do it. Well, it's just not true. Like even with our current patchwork of laws, we have about 25% of the country voting by mail. So the notion that the pandemic, um, which has so many terrible things about it could be a vehicle for increasing access by getting people accustomed to voting by mail and giving states a reason why they have to figure out how to ramp up the volume. That is one possible um, silver lining in all of this. Wonderful. Well, we will be digging into voting rights in America next week in our sessions on Wednesday and Thursday, and we'll be able to uh, talk about the case law and text and history of the Constitution. But Emily, you're just such a, a marvel in helping us to settle all these complicated issues. And, and thank you so much for joining. And do you want to leave our friends with any thoughts about what legal questions they should be looking out for as the election approaches? Yeah, so I would say a couple things. One is um, there already are lawsuits, both Republican, the, the Republican National Committee and the Democratic National Committee are bringing lawsuits around access to balloting questions and you can watch them. Um, so for example, Nevada and New Mexico, I, I might have mentioned the Republicans are trying to prevent mail-in balloting from happening. Um, Democrats have sued in states like Michigan because they are worried that the states don't have a uniform method for verifying people's signatures. You can look out for signature verification as a potential hanging chad problem for 2020. Um, there could be a lot of big fights about that. It is true that a lot of states have no uniform standards, have never done this um, with large volumes before. That's like a big deal. Um, and the second thing I would say to look out for, um, this is like, uh, I've been trying to say this as much as possible. It is very possible that we will not know the results of the election on election night in November. 
And that will feel like maybe something went wrong. We're used to this. The TV coverage relies on the suspense of that night. If we have millions and tens of millions more people voting by mail than have ever done it before, it is very likely that some important swing states will not count all their votes on election night. And we should not assume that something has gone wrong. We should try to be really um, careful in how we absorb and digest the news coverage around all of this and um, what decisions we make about whether the election has been conducted fairly or not. Um, it's possible that there could be some real problem. I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball, but the fact of a delay in itself does not mean that something um, confidence shaking has happened. So you should spread the word about that. Like we should all be prepared to be a little patient about the results. Thank you so much for that. Friends, please join me in thanking so enthusiastically Emily Bazelon for her wonderful insights and for her time. And we will look forward to seeing all of you next week. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Carrie and Jeff. Thank you, Emily.